Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about the uh, motion of a rocket and in general, the motion of a uh, system with variable mass. So if you remember from one of my uh, previous videos that I talked about the second law of Newton, I told you that when uh, you have a system with a variable mass, you cannot write that sum of the forces is equal mass times acceleration. Okay, this is only valid when mass is constant. In a system where the mass is variable like a rocket and as it uh, flies, it uses its fuel and the mass drops, this equation is not valid and you have to use the second law of Newton in its original format which says some of the forces is equal to rate of change of linear momentum where linear momentum is defined as mass times velocity. Okay, so this is the second law of Newton which is available and correct in every situation. And therefore, you will have here sum of the forces to be equal to what? To be equal to, since here is a product, so it is going to be dm over dt times v plus m times dv over dt. So this term is the acceleration. But this term here, dm over dt, is not zero. So this is what you should be using if you have a system with a variable mass. Okay. As an example, let's look at the motion of a system that has a constant flow of mass out of it, like the rocket. So what's the equation of motion for this rocket? So let's take a look. So here, I consider this to be my uh, rocket. And this is at time what? At time t. Okay, let me draw it similar to what it is right now. So this is my rocket. And this is at time t. And here, the mass of this guy is m, and the um, speed of this in whatever direction it is moving, it is equal to v. Okay, so this is my rocket at time t with mass m and velocity v. Now, what I would like to do is to uh, look at the same system when the time passes a little bit and some of the fuel is burned to generate the thrust. So here my time is T plus delta T. My time is passed a little bit. The velocity of the rocket is changed because some fuel is... Uh, burned and pushed against the air to generate the thrust and so my speed is going to change for the rocket itself so it is going to be v plus delta v and as i said some part of the fuel is burned and it is what it is coming out so there is this let's say this is the mass that is burned right and this mass here, I show it as delta m of f. Okay, this is the mass of this guy. Or it can say m of f, doesn't matter. And uh, the speed of this is going to be v plus vf. Where vf here is the speed of the outcoming gas with respect to the rocket. So this Vf is not with respect to the inertial frame. 
let me write it for you somewhere so this guy here is the velocity of the exhaust with respect to the rocket so if i want the speed of it with respect to an inertial frame i have to add the speed of the um, rocket to it and you might say well it is downward not upward could be depend on how fast the rocket is moving and how fast this is coming out of the nozzle okay depending on which one of this is bigger it could be upward or downward but uh Definitely, it is going to show itself as a positive or a negative sign here. And here, to simplify the problem, we assume that between time t and delta t, no force is acting on the rocket. Okay, no external force other than, of course, we'll see the force that is the result of this fuel coming out, which we call thrust. Nothing other than that, which we'll see again, I'll show you where that force comes from. Nothing else is acting on it. You know there is mg. Okay, but if we assume for the moment, just to derive the initial equation, then I will add mg and drag and everything. So for the moment, let's assume no force is acting on the rocket between these two time points. We know there is, but let's just neglect them. If we do that, then... It means the sum of external forces is equal to zero, and we know that when sum of the external forces is equal to zero, what does that mean? Yes, you know that when sum of the external forces is equal to zero, you learn that this d over dt is zero, which means m times v has to be what? Constant, correct? And what did we call this? You're right. We call it principle of conservation of linear momentum for the whole system. And this is what we use to solve, let's say, impact problems. Correct? Just go back and watch my video on impact. This is called principle of what? Conservation of total linear momentum. Okay, so here the system that I am considering is basically the uh, fuel plus the rocket. This is my system. So of course, the rocket is applying a force to the fuel. The fuel is applying a force that is going out to the rocket, which we call thrust. Okay, but um, again, if you look at the whole system and assuming that no external force is applied. So here we are neglecting what? Mg and the drag force. If we do that or say their magnitudes are small compared to the thrust, which is not really always the case. But if we do that, then we can say the total momentum of the system between position 1 and position 2 is not going to change. So the total linear momentum of 1 is equal to total linear momentum in 2. Now, total linear momentum in 1 is simply m times v. The total linear momentum in position 2 is going to be m. Now, the thing is, this m is not going to be m again. Why? Because a small portion of it is gone as a fuel. So the mass of the rocket with the fuel in it is actually going to be m minus this delta m of the fuel. Whatever is out as the exhaust 
should be subtracted from the original mass, okay? So this is going to be M minus delta MF times V plus delta V. And then plus delta MF times V plus what? VF, correct? So this is the momentum of the fuel exhaust. This is the momentum of the rocket. And this is the initial momentum of the rocket. This thing should stay the same. It's constant. Good. Now let's see if we can simplify this a little bit. So here... You will get MV on the left. On the right, you have several terms. Here, you have two term, two terms. So you will get MV plus M delta V minus V delta MF minus delta V delta MF plus V delta MF and plus VF delta mf and now we try to eliminate terms so this mv and this mv would go away and then we have here um, negative v delta mf positive v delta mf so these two will also go away and all you will have remaining are three terms, one here, one here, and one here. That's all. So if I write the simplified version, it is going to be M delta V is equal to, and I take these two terms, this one and this one, to the left-hand side, or, or I can say, um, yeah, and then switch it. So you will get um, delta V, delta MF, and minus VF times delta MF. Then I will divide both sides by delta T, which is the time over which this change has happened. For this one, I can also divide this by another delta T and then multiply the whole thing by a delta T. Okay, so I can write it like this. And now if I apply a limit to both sides as delta t goes to zero because I want to get instantaneous equations. Okay, so I'm going to apply a limit to the left side as delta t goes to zero. And I would also apply a limit to the right side when delta t is going to zero. Here, because this is like V dot, this is like MF dot, but this delta T is going to go to zero, so this whole thing is going to go to zero. So what you will get is going to be M dV over dT is equal to negative VF 
times d of mf over dt. And this is the governing equation for um, the uh, motion of the rocket, where Vf, as we said, is the speed of the exhaust with respect to the rocket, and this is the rate of burning the fuel. Okay? dmf over dt now this is your thrust force here on the right and this is mass times of course acceleration right so you know this db over dt here is your acceleration and this whole term here is called the thrust this is the it acts like a force correct if you write your equation as m times a equals summation of the forces, correct? This guy here acts like a force, which is clearly due to the exhaust of a portion of the mass out, and because of the conservation of uh, linear momentum of the system, if you get a portion of the mass out in this way, the rest of it should get some extra momentum in the opposite way because the total of it should not change since there was no external force. And therefore, um, you will get this thrust term here. Okay. Now you might say, well, if I start with zero initial speed or velocity magnitude, then is this kind of, is this term here going to be negative? And if this is negative, it means what? I would never go up. Because if I start with speed of zero, my speed needs to start becoming positive and then bigger and bigger, bigger positive values. And the rocket goes up. If the total force is negative, which is downward, how come the rocket goes upward? Well, the thing lies here in the signs for these two terms. Okay, dmf over dt and vf. Okay, in this thrust term, uh, well, which term do you think could be negative? Is there any of them that could be negative? Correct. Is one of them have the possibility of becoming a negative? Sure. Which one? Let's go back and take a look. So if you look here, I have added my VF to V, as if VF is what? Upward, right? So it means if this is the rocket, and this is the V, then VF is also like that. So you add them together. But you know the exhaust is going to go downward. So the actual sign of Vf, if V is positive, then it has to be negative Vf. If you consider it positive, then it should carry a negative sign. Okay, so this guy here is actually negative. This guy is positive. So the whole thing is going to be positive. And so your acceleration will be positive, so your speed is going to increase and it is going to lift. Okay, so it's in the sign of the after. Or if uh, starting from the beginning, we started writing this guy here as V minus Vf, then this term would be negative. Okay. And so, when you brought it to the other side, this term will be positive, and this term will be positive. Okay, and you don't need to worry about the direction of Vf. Okay, but in general, remember that is going to help you move upward. Good. Now, let's look at the specific case, and you might say, well, I could have, I, I can see this equation here also from that second law of Newton. Couldn't you see that? Well, if I go back here and look at this original equation, 
if the sum of the external force, which I said is equal to zero, this is your A term. And this here is exactly, if you take it to the other side, this is going to be MA equals negative V uh, dm over dt. You see, negative V dm over dt. And if you look down here, is what? Negative V dm over dt. What's the difference here? The difference here is this VF is measured with respect to the rocket. Here, the V is measured with respect to the inertial frame. But you can easily convert them to each other. But you clearly see that you could have got this also from that original equation. Good. So now, let's look at a specific case that uh, this um, VF is constant. So if you can keep your magnitude of VF constant, right, in the same direction with the constant magnitude, then you know that DMF over dt is what? It is the negative of dm over dt, correct? Because the total mass of the system is constant, right? So if by m here you mean the mass of the remaining of the rocket and fuel, correct? Whatever it is at the moment, Whatever is taken out as the fuel burned is what is subtracted from the actual mass of the rocket, right? So if this rate is like one kilogram per minute and is positive, it means the mass of the whole rocket and the fuel is uh, negative of one kilogram per minute because that's the mass going out as the exhaust. So if I do that, then, and if I consider one direction only for a V, right, so I assume it doesn't maneuver, it's just going in one direction, so I treat everything as a scalar, it would be M dV over dT is equal to negative VF times negative dM over dT. Okay? So here are the magnitudes, then I will get rid of these two negatives, I would get rid of the dt's, and I separate the variables. If I do that, I will get dm over m is equal to um, dv over vf. Correct? And now I assume I can integrate both of these, can't I? If I integrate both of these, both sides, this goes from initial mass M0 to M, and this is going from my uh, initial speed to final speed. Now let's assume for a moment that my initial speed is zero. Okay. So this is assumption that V at zero is zero. So you're starting a rocket from stationary and you want to look at how the velocity depends on the mass. If you do that, then clearly the left-hand side is a natural log of M over M naught. And this one here is going to be V over VF. Therefore, you can see V is going to be, or V of time, is going to be V of F, the speed of the exhaust, times natural log of M, which is a function of time, 
divided by m naught. And let's make sure I did not make any mistake here. Okay. Looks all good. And the only thing is here this VF in terms of magnitude. Okay, so I did not really consider the magnitude of VF. As I told you, this magnitude of VF is what? It is negative. But everything else is good. So if you want, I can multiply it by a negative, or if I consider this VF to be positive, I should write it like this. I should write it as negative VF, times mm, the negative natural log of m over m naught. Now this negative VF is the positive magnitude. This is the uh, magnitude of the exhaust with respect to the body of the rocket. Just magnitude of it, which is positive. And here this negative can go inside the natural log and make this m over m naught the reciprocal. So your final equation will be V of T equals negative of F. If you want, I just call it V of exhaust. Exhaust, uh, let's not say exit or something. Times natural log of M naught over m and m is a function of time okay so this is the equation that will give you the velocity of the rocket at any point if you start from zero if you neglect the effect of gravity as well as what as well as the effect of air drag, then this would tell you how your velocity would change. And clearly you know that m of t is always less than or equal m naught. So this ratio is always bigger than one, and when it's bigger than one, the natural log of that, the whole thing is positive. And as time goes on, this denominator gets smaller and smaller because the mass of the whole system drops. So this number gets bigger and bigger. Natural log gets bigger and bigger. And if this is constant, then the whole thing, the velocity gets bigger and bigger. So as a result of the thrust, your system is going to gain what? Gain larger and larger speeds. And that's how the rocket keeps getting faster and faster as long as the thrust is there. Or if we want to say it more accurately, as long as the thrust overcomes gravity and the drag force, right? Because here we neglected them, but in real life you cannot neglect them. So uh, if we want to include them, then your equation is not going to be just that nice. Okay, then you have to include also the two other terms, which is the force of the gravity and the force of what? The force of air drag. So instead of your equation being like m dv over dt, and here instead of this negative vf, which the whole thing is positive, I just use V of exhaust.
times what? Was uh, uh, D uh, MF over DT, which is the rate of burn of the fuel. So this is your thrust force. And then minus, if you assume that you're launching the rocket completely vertical. Okay, so this is your rocket. Everything is happening along this vertical axis. So it's a, a rectilinear motion. Right, so this is the direction of the motion V only. Then there are a few forces that are involved. One of them is the thrust force. You also have downward mg. And you also have downward f of drag. Okay, therefore, this guy, which is your uh, exhaust, uh, your f of the uh, thrust, should be subtracted from it mg and f of drag. Okay, so if you want to just write it along one direction, this is what you have. Where again, this one I would call F of trust. So that is going to be your uh, equation of rectilinear motion for the rocket. Now, there are two intricacies here that we have to pay attention to. One is in Mg, the other one is in Fe. This Mg in general is not correct. It has to be like Mg prime. Why? Because as the rocket goes up higher, 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 and if this is something that really carries a satellite, if it's just something that goes up a few hundred feet or something and comes back, well, G is not going to change significantly. But if the change of altitude for this rocket is really significant, then G is going to change with the height from the surface of the Earth, right? So, if you are launching this guy from the surface of the Earth, right? And then, so this distance here from here to here is R of the Earth. Correct. This is what you initially launch, and then as it goes up, so the rocket is like here, so now it is at altitude Y, or H, whatever you want to call it, from the surface then you have to add this re to it to get the central distance so over there g prime as you know is related to g but that's smaller than g so it is what it is g times r e squared divided by r e plus y the whole thing squared okay so the constant of gravity g does depend on the altitude so you have to include that in your gravity force and also your drag force as you know it is equal to what equal to one half a coefficient called drag coefficient cd times rho of the air times the cross section of the object times the magnitude of the velocity squared. And as I said in the previous video that I made on uh, orbital motion, or in my other videos, there are also intricacies with uh, these guys. The CD in general is not a constant number, so the CD actually is a function of velocity. 
for different velocities, what we call Reynolds number, the CD is going to be different. This A is also different, but here, if we assume that it's like it's just directly going up, then we might roughly say A can be constant, but in general, it is always the cross section of the object uh, measured in the direction of the relative flow, okay, in the angle of attack direction. It has to project it, be projected by that angle. So even if we say A is constant, then rho of air is not constant. Rho of air is definitely a function of the altitude y. Okay, so if we want to uh, simulate this motion, it is not going to be super easy. Because you need to know these two pieces of information, and specifically rho of air as a function of altitude is not super easy. Okay, so the equation of motion for rockets in actual scenario is quite more complicated. And here I have made a simulink for you, where I have a theoretical system on the top, for which the equation of motion is just what we derived. And that was uh, basically this one in the uh, previous page, correct? Where M goes down and V goes up. There is no uh, weight and there is no drag force. And here on the bottom, I have added those terms. So I have the drag force here, and for the drag force, I considered constant numbers for CD, for rho, and A, which is definitely not real correct, okay? And you have to uh, basically have CD as a function, as I said, of velocity, and rho as a function of altitude. So here, just for simplicity, since it's not easy to acquire those functions, I assume all of these three numbers are constant. I just plug the number here. And uh, the initial mass of the rocket with the fuel, I assume 1,000 uh, kilograms. The rate of change of fuel is 2 kilograms per second, and um, it's constant. So the mass of the uh, rocket and the fuel remaining at any point is going to be M equal M naught minus that constant uh, dmf over dt times t, correct? So if dmf over dt, which is the same as negative dm over dt, is just a constant like k, then you can say that m at any point is, is initial m minus k times t, correct? All you need is to cross multiply this top equation and integrate it. And uh, this is what I used in that simulation, right? So this is the mass that is multiplied by dv over dt. And this is equal to that constant number k times the constant number vf, or v exhaust. Right, so this is the rate of burning fuel, this is the exhaust speed. Multiply them, that's your thrust force. Then the thrust force is equal to the current mass times the dv over dt. From here you can find dv over dt. Which is going to be k times v exhaust divided by m of t. And m of t you can write it as m naught minus kt. Okay, and then you integrate it to get your V first, because that's your acceleration. And then you integrate it one more time to get your position. So here, that's what you see on the top. The T, I got it from the RAM function. I multiplied it here, subtracted from M0 to get my M. I have my thrust force, which is the rate of burn of fuel times the um, speed of the fuel coming out. That's the thrust force divided it by m to get the acceleration integrated twice. I started with zero initial velocity and zero position. And I went as far as the mass of the total rocket 
with fuel and everything is above 200. Once the mass goes below 200, I assume all of the fuel is burned. So I assume out of 1,000 kilogram, 800 kilogram is fuel, 200 kilogram are the metal and the rest of the parts that are not fuel, basically, right? And so I continue as long as all of the fuel is burnt and the remaining is just what you want to keep. So uh, you don't want to burn the metals, right? Or if there is any person in it. So I have the stop here. I provide large enough time. And whenever this condition is uh, not valid, so it drops below 200, it would stop the simulation automatically. Again, I'll just made up some numbers. They could or could not be realistic. In the bottom one, everything is the same, except that I added the drag force as a negative force, as you can see. For, again, this constant CD row A, I use constant numbers. They are not really constant. And I also have a corrected weight. So it is M times G, where M is calculated at any point. And for G, if you remember, I told you G has to be corrected for the height, right? I told you that G is not going to be constant. It is going to be G R E squared over R E plus Y squared. G is going to drop by the altitude. And that's what this function does. It takes Y, it takes your M at any point, and then with this function, I'm going to correct for the altitude. And here I provided in this function G and R E. And so that is the corrected weight. And now I can simulate the behavior of both systems. And then I show them side by side and then separately. So here I run it. I just first show you the case that you don't consider weight and drag force. And you see that here, the mass, if you look at it, you start at 1,000. And then with the constant drop, which is that uh, 2 kilogram per uh, second, you are going to drop until 400. So with the slope of two after 400 seconds, you have burned 800 kilogram. Out of 1,000, you are down to 200 kilogram, which is the condition for stopping. And uh, here you can see the velocity that is uh, increasing as a logarithmic, as a natural log function. So you start from zero after 400 seconds, your speed is 9,000 something, okay? And you can definitely uh, go and do some measurements here. So uh, you have to just limit it to two points, maybe somewhere here. And this one, you can make it super close to that, somewhere like that almost. And if you look at the value of... Um, You have the two time points, and then you have the y values. If you look at the y values, they are about 9,600 meters per second. Okay, so you can uh, go from zero to 9,600 meters per second, which is a big speed, in 400 seconds, which is uh, close to seven minutes, six, seven minutes. And this is the position of the rocket. You start from the ground and go all the way up to an altitude of um, more than 14 times 10 to the 5 or 1.4 times 10 to the 6 1 point so it's about uh, 1400 kilometers okay and here I show them side by side so if you look at the two velocities one of them I called V actual, the other one I call V simplified. Simplified is the top one where there is no weight, there is no drag. Uh, and actual, actual is the bottom one where there is a drag and there is weight. And you clearly see the simplified is way faster than the actual. Of course, because both gravity and the drag force are negative forces. They will try to neutralize the effect of the thrust. So if those guys are not there, of course, the truss is going to accelerate it to very larger speeds. But here you see that I expect something like 9600, but really what I might get after that time 
could be something like what? Like even less than a thousand. Here it's clearly about like 500 or so. Four or 500. So you see, they make huge differences. Huge differences. And uh, now it might be all in the case of this drag force, what numbers you are using. Okay, and again, this is completely just, it's not real actual, because I don't have actual functions for CD and row. But you definitely see that it makes sense, you will get smaller speeds. Okay, so hopefully you learned how to deal with a system that has variable mass, like a rocket, how you look at the motion of it, and how you can simulate it. So thank you so much for your attention. See you in the next lecture.